side where Kathy McMorris Rogers is speaking now on this matter. Let's, this is Republicans GOP news conference on this matter. Let's listen. Ideas like Sheriff John Rutherford's idea on the Stop School Violence Act. These are the kind of ideas that help our local communities prevent, recognize, and respond when there are warning signs of violence. And I am pleased to yield to the author of the legislation, Sheriff Rutherford. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, I first want to thank all the leadership that is here, uh, Whip Scalise and uh, Leader McCarthy and, and uh, our conference chair, who have been am amazing supporters of this bill, helping to, to, to move it forward. Uh, the action that the House just took, I, I think, is a, an important first step forward in protecting our children our teachers, and other administrators within our schools, because it is, it is going to not only harden the target through technology, but most importantly, I believe, it's actually going to provide the tools and education needed by those in our schools to recognize these individuals who have a propensity to become active shooters. Uh, as, as Sheriff back in Duval County, I always told my community and my officers that I did not want to be the best first responder to an active shooter event. We must prevent it before it occurs. And so that's what this bill does. That's the goal of this bill, is to provide prevention within our schools. And so, again, I want to thank all of my colleagues uh, who really made this bill stronger and uh, through some of the changes that we, that we initiated uh, through the process, and say thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Goodlatte, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. One of our highest priorities as legislators is to protect those who are vulnerable, especially children. When students go to school fearing for their safety, we need to take action to protect them from harm. I applaud the passage of the Stop School Violence Act, which takes a multifaceted approach to the epidemic of school violence that has shocked the nation. This bill empowers students, teachers, and law enforcement and trains them how to recognize and respond to warning signs. With increased training, technology, and coordination with law enforcement, we can be better prepared to defend students from violence and respond quickly and effectively to threats as they arise. No student should ever have to go to school in fear. We will continue to listen to students, teachers, and administrators to examine the issue of school safety and improve the classroom environment for our nation's children. This bill is a great first step, and I thank my colleagues, Representatives Rutherford, Shabbat, Granger, Davis, Messer, Voss, Kaufman, Brooks, and many others for their collaboration on this important bill. <clears throat> At a time when people are asking Washington to do something, uh, Congress actually took action today to not just do something, but to start addressing the problem with a strong bill, uh, the Top School Violence Act, uh, that gives students, teachers, and law enforcement more tools to actively identify a potential shooter before a tragedy happens. Uh, what we saw in Parkland was an example of so many breakdowns in government at the federal level with the FBI, uh, at the local level with local law enforcement. Uh, when so many students knew this was going to happen, uh, I think the thing that irritates people the most is that something wasn't done to stop it before it did happen. And we need to focus on stopping those tragedies before they happen. As Sheriff Rutherford said, uh, I want to commend Sheriff Rutherford for his leadership uh, to put a coalition together that was incredibly bipartisan. Uh, what you saw today was a 407 to 10 vote to specifically start addressing the problem to stop school violence. And I think that overwhelming bipartisan vote shows how serious this bill is. And clearly there are more things that need to be done but this is one of those things that actually gets to the heart of addressing the problem to stop school violence 
before a tragedy happens. Representative Steve Scalise there, whom you'll remember was uh, so, so badly injured in, when the shooting happened at the baseball practice there on Capitol Hill, the GOP was practicing, and he's become sort of a spokesman for this sort of thing. Uh, and there's no doubt that this, this bill calls for more funding for s school security, including assessment teams, as you heard them say, for schools, better training for schools and law enforcement to detect dangerous behavior in kids. But what it does not do is what the students are demonstrating for and what they're calling for so vocally, really from sea to shining sea and from coast to coast to coast in Florida, and that is some level of gun control, uh, an age limit for buying long guns and some other control measures, and they're not getting them. The NRA is against them, so they're not getting them. Chad Pergram's up on Capitol Hill. This is uh, something in the middle that doesn't please too many, it would appear at least. Yeah, a lot of people wonder if this is just a panacea. And you mentioned Steve Scalise, who got shot at the baseball practice last June. Just yesterday, Shep, about a half mile from that baseball field in Alexandria, Virginia, there was a school resource officer whose firearm went off while in the school. It's a middle school that's close to that uh, baseball field. And people are saying, well, you know, should we arm the teachers? Should we have more school resource officers? And some of the parents after that incident were asking, well, if even the law enforcement can't control their weapons, how are we going to arm teachers? But again, this is a political question here on Capitol Hill, whether or not they can get anything done on guns. Chuck Schumer, the minority leader in the Senate, has pushed for at least a debate on assault weapons and long guns, as you mentioned there. The question for some moderate Democrats, remember there's an awful lot of them who are up for re-election this fall, they don't want to have that debate because that's bad politics in those swing states. Chad, you're the best. Chad Pergram on the Hill. You can see the president is arriving now. Uh, he's in St. Louis. Remember yesterday the president uh, was looking at uh, border wall prototypes down along the border in San Diego and today he is arriving at a Boeing plant in Missouri and it's interesting because their real concerns the aerospace industry and the plane manufacturing because uh, the president has suggested new tariffs and there are great concerns it's some some cheering for the president Let's listen for a second there big crowd out on the tarmac as the president live arrives, maybe he'll talk. Let's listen. Sometimes he does, you know. What's that? Oh, nice. Oh, wow, that's beautiful, huh? That's good. Thank you. That's for you, right? Thank you, darling. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Hey. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. President signing a MAGA hat, it looks like there. Uh, but I mentioned there, there are concerns today. tell many of you that this, this is the kind of thing that gives the president life. Maybe the only thing better for him than a rope line is really up, up on a stage at a big rally. And you'll remember last week he did that rally in Moon Township, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's 18th, rallying for Saccone there, who it appears at least, it, it's not a done deal, but he's trailing and 
The experts seem to think that Connor Lamb, the Democrat, is going to win that thing. But that, be that as it may, the president, according to his insiders, was really energized by that and, and said to folks around him, I want to do more of this. I want to do more rally-style events. I want to keep the base engaged. I, I want a new group of people around me who will be more like how I want them to be. I want my team to come together in a different way. I'm going to make changes, and he's been making changes. And now he's suggesting that there will be a was suggesting new tariffs on Chinese merchandise. And take a look at the Dow or Chinese imports. This has really uh, taken a real hit on the Dow today. We're, we're off a percent here, a little more than that on the S&P. The concern really is that there may be a trade war with the Chinese. You see at the top of the graph there where it was green at the beginning of the day, the Dow was up about 100 points. S&P and the Nasdaq were up. It was a great start to the day. And now we're off 250. Uh, and all of this is about market concerns over, a t over, over tariffs, uh, Boeing not having a great day from what, from what I've been told at least, uh, some serious concerns. Let's bring in Bill Barrows, National Politics Editor for the Associated Press. He's in Pittsburgh, he's been covering this election. The, the, the president was really energized by his trip to Moon Township and the Republicans are making the argument, well, he was down more than this and he got him almost back there. And Democrats are just like, just stop it. They should have won this in a landslide, and they didn't, and there's trouble ahead. I wonder how you see it as one who's on the ground reporting this stuff. I think your take is pretty on target there, Shep. The, uh, the president does legitimately inspire his core base. We saw that throughout 2016, but he's also never had numbers above the 50% threshold, and that's a very important line when you look back at midterm elections historically. Presidents below 50 lose significantly more seats in their first midterms than presidents who are above 50. And we saw that dynamic play out in Pittsburgh. To be clear, there were lots of other variables, too. Of course. Uh, Connor Lamb, you know, it, it's not really right. The White House has been a little too generous to itself to say that you know, he basically ran as a Republican. He cuddled up to the president. That's not really what he did. He shifted the conversation away from the president. And, and, and I think the lesson we, we draw there is you have these kinds of districts, these more conservative, center-right, Republican-leaning districts, where the savvy Democratic nominee is not going to necessarily embrace the president. They're going to talk about other things because the Democratic energy is real, even in these places, even if the numbers are down. And the folks that want to go vote for a Democrat because they're angry about the president will do so anyway. Connor Lamb doesn't have to lead the Connor Lamb kind of nominee doesn't have to lead an Our Revolution rally to get those votes. He can then go talk about other things. The, the and still, he talked about social... Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I just wanted to say that this idea that no matter what party you're in, you need a candidate mm -hmm. who matches the district. All politics yes. are local. And in Allegheny yes. County and across that 18th district, which is going to go mm -hmm. away here in a few months, but in that right. district, Connor Lamb was like a, 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 a cutout for what that district is, seems to be seeking right now. Yes, and he, he's from the district, he's of the district, all politics are he local, all politics are, yes, all politics are identity <laughs> politics, and they saw Connor Lamb as one of them. He embraced organized labor, uh, he told the story of his family, and he talked, he spoke in the language of the, the old democratic politics that, that once carried the day here. Yep, unions were there with him, and, and it was a, mm -hmm. quite a thing to watch late into the night last night. Uh, Bill Barrow from Associated Press. Appreciate it. Lots more coverage ahead. Lots of news this afternoon, and we're glad to have you in. Bottom of the hour headlines right after this. Dan, this is big. Let's listen. Exposed. Police officer Nick Bailey was the first to arrive on the scene and remains hospitalized in serious condition. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the victims of this atrocious crime. No two nations enjoy a stronger bond than that of the United States and the United Kingdom. Ours is truly a special relationship. When our friends in Great Britain face a challenge, the United States will always be there for them. Always. Alone, Russia's crime is worthy of this council's action. But this is not an isolated incident. The assassination attempt in Salisbury is part of an alarming increase in the use of chemical weapons. Last year, the North Korean regime used the nerve agent VX to publicly assassinate Kim Jong-un's brother in a Malaysian airport. In Syria, 
the Assad regime continues to kill its own people with chemical weapons years after this council passed Resolution 2118 to remove the threat from Syria's chemical weapons program. When the Security Council created a mechanism to investigate chemical weapons attacks, that mechanism was targeted when it began to shine a spotlight on Assad's role in killing his own people. A growing concern in all of this dangerous and destabilizing activity is Russia. Russia failed to ensure Syria destroyed its chemical weapons program. Russia killed the joint investigative mechanism when it found Assad liable for chemical attacks. Russia used its veto to shield Assad five times last year. It has also provided cover for Syria in The Hague at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. The Russians complained recently that we criticize them too much. If the Russian government stopped using chemical weapons to assassinate its enemies, and if the Russian government stopped helping its Syrian ally to use ke chemical weapons to kill Syrian children, and if Russia cooperated with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons by turning over all information related to this nerve agent, we would stop talking about them. We take no pleasure in having to constantly criticize Russia, but we need Russia to stop giving us so many reasons to do so. Russia must fully cooperate with the UK's investigation and come clean about its own chemical weapons program. Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council. It is entrusted in the United Nations Charter with upholding international peace and security. It must account for its actions. If we don't take immediate concrete measures to address this now, Salisbury will not be the last place we see chemical weapons used. They could be used here in New York or in cities or of any country that sits on this council. This is a defining moment. Time and time again, member states say they oppose the use of chemical weapons under any circumstance. Now one member stands accused of using chemical weapons on the sovereign soil of another member. The credibility of this council will not survive if we fail to hold Russia accountable. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United States for her statement. I now give the floor to the representative of France. Well, there you go. That, the, the back story on all this, and I'm sure you've heard about some of this, uh, there was a poisoning that happened of a former Russian agent uh, inside Great Britain. And the thinking was, at the time, that the Russians were trying to silence, intem otherwise intimidate, their own agent uh, who had been going against Russian interests. That happened in Great Britain. The British came to the conclusion that because of the, the, their, the origin of the nerve agent, that the Russians were directly responsible for this. And Theresa May, the British Prime Minister, came to the microphone just yesterday uh, and before lawmakers there in Great Britain and said, we're going to hold the Russians accountable. And they have. Uh, they expelled 23 Russian diplomats. Uh, that was just today, actually, this morning, local time. They're four hours ahead of Eastern time. Uh, and that was sort of how the day had been progressing. Now, remember, the White House was sort of not weighing in on this yesterday. Uh, the, president, the president's spokesperson was asked about it repeatedly, given the opportunity to condemn Russia on this matter. Then later in the day, during this hour, the president was down there on the border in San Diego with the prototypes of the wall and, and said, look, if Russia, if we're still working on the facts, but if it turns out Russia was responsible for this and, and we agree with the British, then we'll condemn them. Well, the fact of the matter is the United States and Great Britain share intelligence in a way that we were the same entity, or that's how we've rolled over the years. If the British know it, the United States intelligence agents know it, and, and vice versa. So whatever the Brits knew, we knew. And the question had been, will the president condemn the Russians on this matter? Because as you know, he's been hesitant to condemn the Russians on just about anything. Uh, well, now Nikki Haley has done that and said, you know, we hate to have to keep, keep uh, taking it to the Russians, but they keep giving us so many reasons to do so. 
And now, there before the, the world body, Nikki Haley has condemned the Russians. It will be fascinating to find out whether the President of the United States comes to the microphone to condemn the Russians as well. You heard Nikki, Nikki Haley saying if they're going to use nerve agents on someone in Great Britain, they could just as easily do it here because the widespread thinking is the Russians are poking at us. How far can they go before the United States decides to retaliate? After all, our own Congress has said that there should be sanctions on the Russians, and the White House has not put those sanctions into place. And the widespread question across Washington, Republican and Democrat, has been, why? And to that, there has been no answer. So will the president condemn the Russians? Will the president put sanctions to Secretary of State Rex Tillerson with the CIA director, Michael?